My child, you've been on my mind for such a long time. I've been looking forward to this since the very beginning. So many plans I've dreamed for you. So many things that we've been destined to do together. I really can't wait. Now you probably have a thousand reasons why you think I feel differently, that I'm upset with you, or just uninterested, or even angry. None of this is true. The truth is, my door is always open, and I'm writing this letter to welcome you in. Please hear me when I say with all my heart, you're invited. Well, friends, this Christmas season, we want everybody to know that you're invited. You're invited into hope. You're invited into joy. You're invited into peace. You're invited into love. You are invited into relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ. My name is Brian Mowry. I'm one of the lead pastors here, and it's just a privilege to share from God's Word this morning. And uh, I hope that you're having a very Merry Christmas uh, this season. Today, I want to talk to you about joy. How we're invited into joy, that actually joy is, is possible. No matter your circumstances or situation, you can experience joy. I have four daughters, as many of you know, and uh, my second daughter, her name is Nora. And Nora is like living with Cindy Lou Who all the time. She is the most joyful person I've ever met in my life, and um, it's just contagious. Let me tell you a little story about Nora, and I did get her permission to share this one. Last year, Nora tried out to be on student council, and so we helped her with her speech. And so she gave, had to give a speech, and in her speech were the eight reasons why her classmates should vote for her to represent them on student council. If a Maori is going to give a speech, it's going to be good, All right? <laughs> So Becca worked with her <laughs> on it. And so Nora went in on the day, and, and she gave her speech. And she came home, and I, I wasn't there, but, but De- Becca told me the story. She came home, and, and her face was just was glowing with excitement, pure joy and, and happiness on Nora's face. And Becca said, what happened, Nora? What happened? Did you give your speech? Yeah, Mama, I gave my speech. How did it go? Oh, it went really well. I gave my eight reasons, and it, it was fantastic. Mama, there are two positions on student council. Yeah? What happened? Did you, get, did you get the first position? No. River got the first position. But guess what, Mama? He was on it last year, so he's going to be very good. <laughs> so... You must have got the second position. No, Jason got the second position. But you know, his family comes to our church, and I'm really happy for him. His family comes to our church? I could make an impeachment happen here pretty quickly, (laughs) if need be. But mama, don't don't worry, There's, there's an alternate position. Yeah, yeah, did you get the alternate position? No. Sadie got the alternate position, but she's going to be wonderful at it. But guess what, Mama? There's an alternate to the alternate. And you got that? Yes. How many people gave a speech? Four people (laughs) gave a speech, Mama. And I'm one of them. (laughs) We didn't have the heart to tell her, you came in last. (laughs) But she was so filled with joy that she, she was joyful because her friends got the positions. I, I, I don't experience that kind of joy all the time. But as a father, i got to tell you, what I'm trying to do with my Nora is, is protect her joy. You know, because our, our, our world and our, our life can sometimes rob and, and steal our joy. And maybe for, for us as adults, we, we used to have that life of just constant joy. We were joyful for things, and somewhere along the line, our, our joy has been stolen. And so I want to talk to you today about, about joy. I think this is, is something that every person wants, right? We, we all want happiness. We all want gladness. We all want joy in our life. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what joy is. I want to talk to you about how we receive joy, who it's for. Um, 
But let's start with a definition. Uh, the very best definition that I found of joy comes from a guy, his name is Jack Wellman. And this is how he defines joy. He says, joy is an emotion that's acquired by the anticipation, the acquisition, or even the expectation of something that's great or wonderful. It's a good definition, isn't it? That joy is an emotion acquired by the anticipation, the acquisition, or even the expectation of something great or wonderful. So this leads to the question now, what is that great and wonderful thing in your life that brings joy? If joy comes from something that is great and wonderful, the anticipation of it, whether maybe you've already acquired it or the expectation of it, what is it that for you brings joy? What is that great and wonderful thing? See, friends, I think for, for many people, we run to things like achievement or accomplishment. And this is our source of joy. This is the thing that is going to be great and wonderful. If I can just accomplish this, if I can just get this degree, if I can just get this position, if I can just get this sum in my bank account, if I can just get this resource, this, this accomplishment, then, then I'll experience great joy. Or maybe for, for others of us, we, we go after an event. Maybe it's a wedding or a ceremony or a, a ceremony of honor or something, an event that's coming up. And we just, we push in and we lean into that event and, and it's the source of our, of our joy. But then that, that event comes and it, and it goes and we're left without any joy. Or maybe for some, that great thing, that wonderful thing is a dream of ours. It's a dream of of, of a marriage or, or somebody that would walk with you in, 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 in friendship or maybe it's a dream of a, starting a business or maybe it's a dream of a, a house on the lake. That sounds nice right about now. And it's just in the accomplishment of that dream, then I'll, I'll receive great joy. I'll, I want to pause here and, and just say this, is that there are different brands of joy out there. We even see in Scripture the stories of biblical characters who went after different brands of, of joy. You read the story of Solomon in Ecclesiastes. He, he went after a brand of joy, and that brand of joy was defined by things and experiences. And he went after everything that he could possibly own, and he was very wealthy, so he could own everything. He went after every experience in order to find real joy, and it left him empty. He experienced everything. He, he had everything materially, yet it left him completely empty. This was a, a brand of joy going after the things of this world. Then we read about King David. In Psalm chapter 4, he himself said that, that he knew joy, and here's why. He says that God placed joy in his heart, and this was everlasting joy. This is the, kind of, this is the brand of joy that I want to talk to you about this morning it's the joy that comes from knowing and serving and walking with our king. His joy placed in our heart. And this is why we're able to walk through any season and discover joy. Because we walk with the king. We walk with the one who created us. We walk with the one who gives us purpose. We walk with the one who, who loves us and sets us free. And we're able to experience great joy. And scripture warns us of, of counterfeit joy, but it also teaches us about what real joy is. And so I want to I talk to us about real joy today. And I want to look at this story found in Luke chapter 2, which is of the shepherds, as they're encountered by this angel. And I want to share with you six truths about joy from this story. Remember, the shepherds are just minding their own business. They're doing their, their daily work. They're out in their fields. They're just kind of going about life per usual. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears before them. It says this in Scripture that the angel of the Lord came suddenly. And one thing I've been praying for us this morning is that for, for many of us, the Lord would come suddenly, like in an instant, that the Lord would come and he would speak to our hearts, that he might pull us out of a, of a, of a state of depression maybe or, or, or of sorrow and, and pull us into his joy. 
And this is the work of the Lord, my friends. It's not going to be because of any words that I share, but it's going to be the power of the Spirit that comes and, and, and God coming with, with a clear message suddenly to our hearts that changes and lifts us up. And that's what I'm praying today, that we might be lifted up, that we might know the hope and the joy of the Lord. These angels came, this angel came suddenly. And the first lesson about joy is this. The angel says this to start. Don't be afraid. And so the first truth about joy is this, is that joy, joy is released when fear is overcome. When we're able to overcome our fear, this is when joy is released in our life. The problem is, is that so often fear and anxiety can grab a hold of us and keep us from knowing the joy of the Lord. I love here how the angel of the Lord first says, don't be afraid. Before that, we learn that the shepherds are terrified. Of course they are. Wouldn't you be terrified? I mean, my goodness, there you're just going about your, your regular day, making a sales call, right? There you are doing your, your thing. You're teaching your classroom. There you are sitting in your classroom, maybe taking notes from your teacher, and an angel of the Lord appears before you. Of course you'd be terrified. Why is this angel here? What have I done? <laughs> They're terrified. And so immediately the angel of the Lord says, don't be afraid. And here's why I think the angel of the Lord says that. I, I think he's carrying such a great message that he doesn't want the shepherds to miss it because of their fear. Don't be afraid. Listen, I know this is an unusual thing that's happening to you right now. I know this is extraordinary. I know there's a lot for you to look at here a lot for you to wonder about, but, but don't be afraid. I want you to get past your fear. I want you to overcome this moment of fear because I have good news to share with you. I have a great message that's going to lead you into joy. And friends, I, I think we need to hear this message of the angel to us today because so often we can miss, miss the good news of the season, the good news of this angel because we're so fearful of the things that hold us bondage. Don't don't be afraid. We need to lift our eyes up and, and, and see that the Lord has given us great news. Fear robs our joy. And God is offering us great and wonderful news today. But so often, this message that brings joy can be drowned out because of the fear that takes hold of us. And our fear takes many forms. Usually it's this song, and I've, I've shared this with you in the past, but it's this song that we, we play in our head, and it has the same lyric over and over again, and that lyric is, what if? What if I'm not included? What if I miss out? What if I'm not good enough? What if I don't have the gifts for this? What if I'm not loved? What if I'm not accepted? What if people don't look positively at me? What if people have wrong ideas about me? What if? What if? What if I don't have enough? What if I lose everything? What if, what if, what if? And so often our fears become things that haven't even happened to us yet. But they're just the result of this what if game that we play in our minds. What if, what if? We know that scripture teaches us that we can overcome our fears. Scripture teaches us that perfect love casts out fear. What this means is that what Christ has done in, in, in providing a way for us to have relationship with him, this is the way to, to cast out all of our fear by going deeper in, in our relationship and in, into intimacy with the Lord, spending time with him, getting to, to know him. And as we get to know him, we discover who we are as his people. As we study his word, we, we, we receive the truth of who we are. You, are. you are not unloved. You are loved by God. You don't. You're not a pers per person without a purpose. You, you've been given a great purpose here on this earth. You have a future in the Lord. It's an everlasting future. And as we get to know the Lord in this intimate way and we, we know his word, it, it lifts us out of fear and it allows us to receive his message. There, there are a few other things that, that I believe really rob us from joy. As I was thinking about this, and fear is definitely one of them. As I was singing about this and praying, the Lord revealed a few that have robbed me of my joy, of the joy of the Lord in my life. 
and, and maybe for you as well. And the first is this. One thing that, that robs joy from our life is constant comparison. We're really good at comparing and contrasting. All the time we do it. I mean, I'm buying Christmas gifts for people right now, and I'm comparing and contrasting the gift, seeing all the reviews and making sure that I get the very best thing. It took me like three years to buy a pair of sandals one time because I was comparing and contrasting. Becca's like, just buy the sandals for Pete's sake. You're driving me insane. So I'm not always a joyful person to live with, I guess. <laughs> comparing and contrasting. But then we extend that into our life. We compare and contrast well, who I am compared to who you are and the gifts that I have compared to the gifts that you have and the position that I have compared to the position that you have. Our church compared to that church and my business compared to your business and all these things. Comparing and contrasting and all that leads to is, is usually resentment, complaining, bitterness, and we find ourselves in a position where we've lost our joy. And so we need to be aware of these things. The second thing that robs us of, of our joy is unforgiveness. So often. And, and friends, I, I can tell you, all of us have been hurt by people. People are our biggest problem. <laughs> we hurt one another. And you have legitimately been hurt by someone. I'm, I'm sure of it. Somewhere in life, you have. And you can either forgive or you can hold on to that hurt. So that whenever an issue like that comes back up or a situation like that or that person's name comes back up, it's like hitting that hot button for you. And it robs you of joy. And the thing that we don't understand is that so often we think, well, if I forgive, it lets them off the hook. No, when you forgive, it lets you off the hook. It allows you to step into freedom that you might experience real joy. And for some of us, we might be sitting here today listening to this message with unforgiveness living in unforgiveness, holding on to this, this hurt, and, and the person may never know it, but you need to say, Lord, I forgive. I need to release this so that I can experience the joy that you have on offer. The last thing that, that just was brought to my attention here that robs our joy is, is bad company. Bad company robs our joy. You know, it's probably good for us every once in a while to do personal inventory of, of the people that we're hanging around to see if they're life-giving, if they're feeding life into you, if they're encouraging you, lifting you up. Now, this is why we're calling each and every person a part of our church to be a part of a crew, three to five people who are going to lovingly walk with you, encourage you, point things out in your life, but do it in, in love. These are going to be people that are your lifeline, that actually, if you don't have these people as your pastor, I, I'm, I'm concerned about you. And we need these people in our life. Friends, um, joy is released when we're able to overcome these barriers. And fear is certainly one of them. The angel goes on and he says, listen, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. Which leads to the second truth about joy. The second truth is this, is that joy is the result of good news. When you receive news, it affects who you are. When you receive news, it affects your mood. It affects your perspective so often. All of us in the room at some point have received surprising news. And maybe that news was good. Maybe that news was bad. Whichever it was, it, it, it changed you. That news changed you. It changed your mood. It changed your emotion. It, it changed how you approached life, maybe. And news affects us. And here the angel is saying, listen, you're going to experience joy because of the message that I'm about to share with you. I'm about to give you news that's going to change you. And this is where joy often comes from. Joy comes as a result of good news. Now, in our culture, we have this phrase, and you know the phrase. It goes like this. No news is... <laughs> that is the saddest thing I've ever heard. I'm serious. This is arguably one of the saddest things I think we say. No news is good news? Really? And I understand it, and I've used the phrase as well, and here's why we use that phrase, because we receive so much bad news. We're constantly receiving bad news. Here's some more bad news. You look at the news. Oh, let me tell you about bad news. Let me send it down to Johnny. He's going to tell you about more bad news. Oh, I'm back here again. Let me tell you about, we just heard, Oh, more bad news has just come in. We're constantly hearing bad news. 
And so now, as a culture, we've said, okay, to satisfy our joy, what we're going to say is, if we receive no news at all, that means nothing has changed. That's good news. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. No news isn't good news. Good news is good news. And friends, we have great news. Let me tell you, what you feed yourself matters. In your personal diet, what you feed yourself matters. Don't watch what I eat. It won't help you in that department. (laughs) What you feed yourself matters. And and what you feed yourself spiritually matters. And friends, we have great news. Feast on the good news. Feast on the promises of God. These are the things that will lead you into joy. No news is not good news. The news is good news. The news of Jesus Christ is good news, and we have it. The angel of the Lord goes on. He says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy. And here comes the third truth about joy to all people. Say that with me. To all people. All people. Joy is for all people. One of my favorite things about the story here of the shepherds is that the angel of the Lord came to shepherds. They were just shepherds. These were the outcasts of society. They were, they were poor. They were they kind of pushed out. They were hardworking people. But they were an unlikely group of people for the Lord to come and visit. The Lord had been silent for about 400 years, and now he's breaking his silence by going not to the kings, not to the rulers, not to the authority, but to shepherds. I love that. The Lord's making a point here. The angel didn't get his GPS coordinations wrong. Okay, He was sent by God to go to the shepherds. I can imagine the shepherds thinking, well, we're just shepherds. Why are you coming to us? But just shepherds, they are the ones that got to see the glory of the Lord. They got to see the glory of the Lord. When the angel came, they saw the glory of the Lord, this bright, spectacular light. They saw the glory of the Lord. They were just shepherds, yet they were the first ones to know that the king had been born. Now listen, I've had four children, okay? And and usually, all the time actually, whenever they were born, guess who we called first? Our parents. Okay, if you haven't had children yet, just take that down as a note. That's good practice. (laughs) Call your parents first. It would have made a lot of sense if in the scripture it said, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Mary's parents, to Joseph's parents. But the Lord is making a point here. No, the angel of the Lord showed up and appeared before shepherds. They were the first to know. They were serenaded by heaven. Isn't that amazing? If it weren't enough that they got to see an angel of the Lord and the, and the glory of the Lord, now they're serenaded by heaven. The heavenly host comes and, and sings over them. What an amazing thing. Growing up in my house, we, we, when we were young, we'd go through our presents and we'd get to the last one, and then my dad would say, oh, oh, there's one more present. And then he'd send us on a scavenger hunt to find that last present. It was like, wow, we received all this, but there's more. Here the angel comes, and and the shepherd's like, wow, we received all this. Look at this, an angel of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. But there's even more. A whole host of heaven's army comes and serenades them. Just shepherds. They're just shepherds. They were just shepherds. And then later on in the story, we read that these shepherds, they go, and they get to be in the presence of Jesus himself. And they're not onlookers. They come right up to the manger right in the presence of King Jesus. They're just shepherds. And, and, and in this moment of your life, you might be thinking to yourself, well, listen, I, I'm, just, I'm just an average person. I'm just, I'm just a pastor. I'm just, I'm just a banker. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a student. I'm just, I'm just a mother. I'm just a father. I'm just an aunt. I'm just an uncle. I'm just, 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 just. No, friends, you are a child of God. You're a child of God. And what the Lord is doing here with real purpose and, and, and intentionality is he sends his angel to the shepherds so that you might know that this message is for you. This message is for me. Uh, joy is found and is for all people. Uh, J- Jesus himself teaches in John chapter 15. He's teaching his disciples. He says, listen, um, I'm going I'm to tell you how to have life, and this is it. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me, and and you will discover life. If you 
disconnect from me. There's no life there. There's nothing there but remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. So often we try to be the vine. We're the branches. <laughs> the Lord is the vine. Remain in him and, and you will discover life. Right after that, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, I have told you these things, so I've told you that I'm the vine, you're the branches, remain in me. I've told you these things so that you will f- be filled with what? My joy. This is the brand of joy that's on offer. The joy of Jesus. In your heart, in your life, in every season, Jesus goes on, he says, yes, your joy will overflow. I love this. Sometimes I think we think this about God. Man, he, he just wants to like change us and then like mold us and shape us and it's all bad news. No, the Lord wants to bring us into joy. That Jesus actually wants this for you. He wants you to know his joy. The angel goes on, and, and this is where the angel shares the good news. This is the good news. He says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now, here's the good news. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord. I love those three titles. The Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born. The fourth lesson and truth about joy is this, is that joy is found in a Savior. This is the good news, friends, is that we have a Savior. What's it mean that Jesus is our Savior? This is a good question to ask, a good question to to ponder. What does it mean that that Jesus is our Savior? I think there are four words that really help us understand Jesus' role as our Savior. The first word is this, is that he's our rescuer. Part of Jesus being our Savior is that he has rescued us. He's rescued us from our our own demise. He's, He's rescued us from our own sin from our own separation that we've caused between us and the Lord. He's he's rescued us. Now, the problem is, so often people want to just say, well, Jesus is just a great example. He's not Savior. He's just a great example. There's a story about this, how one uh, preacher was giving a message about Jesus. He was sharing with his congregation all about how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. And when you believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. And a parishioner came up to this, this pastor and said, hey, a great message, but I think you should talk more about how Jesus is a great example, not so much how he's a great savior. And the pastor said, okay, well, listen, if I did preach that way about Jesus as a great example, would you follow him? And the man said, of course I would. I'd, I'd follow his example. And the pastor said, okay, then let's start with step one. Step one is this. Jesus never sinned. He never made a mistake. He was perfect. Can you follow that? Of course I can't follow that. I I'm, I'm constantly make mistakes. I constantly come up short. I'm not perfect. Okay, well, then it sounds to me that you don't just need an example. You need a Savior. And friends, we need a rescuer, someone who, who pulls us out of our own mess. Zacchaeus himself in Luke 19 said, The Son of God came to seek and save what? That which is lost. Now, it's really hard for us to admit when we're lost. Just think of, you know, yourself or a friend of yours, your spouse, when they're driving and, and they're, they're sure that they're on track, but they're actually lost. It, you know, uh, people are looking at each other right now. Stop it. Up here. Eyes up here. Eyes up here. Okay? If you're looking at somebody else, it's probably you that's wrong, too. Okay? We hate to admit when we're lost. You'd never go into your workplace and say, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right? No, it, it shows weakness. It doesn't make sense. We don't like letting people know that we are, we're lost. There's a story of a man, his name was John, and um, rescuers found him clinging to his chimney on, the, on top of his roof. There was a, 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 a great flood that happened. He was clinging to his chimney when rescuers found him. The interesting thing was that the rescuers found that John was clinging to the chimney, but he was also holding his cell phone. And so they asked him, why didn't you call us earlier? And John said this. He said, well, listen, I thought I could get myself out of this one. And we might laugh at John and say, that's ridiculous. John, you should have called. People would have come and rescued you. But we do this in our spiritual life all the time. We do this in our life all the time. Well, I can get myself out of this. I can get myself out of this mess. If I just have a little bit more strength, a little bit more time, a little bit more resources some more help, then I can get myself out of this one. Friends, I want to tell you, until we welcome and call on Jesus as our rescuer, we'll never know the freedom that God has on offer for us. We'll never know the joy that 
that Jesus is offering us until we're able to say, man, I'm lost. I need help. I need rescue. The second word is, is Jesus is our Savior means he's our deliverer. If rescue means that he, he rescues us out of something, deliverance means that he delivers us into something. And I love that about our Jesus, that he doesn't just rescue us out of something, but he welcomes us into something. He welcomes us into a walk and a relationship with him. He welcomes us into, into freedom, which leads me to my third word. And the third word is this, is that Jesus as Savior is our healer. What Jesus does as Savior is he heals our relationship with the Father. And think of the story of Peter. I love the story of Peter. Peter denies Jesus how many times? Three times. <laughs> Now Jesus dies, he resurrects from the, from the dead, and, and he, he comes, he's back on earth now. He's, he's walking among his people. The, uh, the women discover the empty tomb, and they discover Jesus, and Jesus says, go and tell my disciples, including who? Peter. By name, he calls him out. I love that. And then Jesus goes down to the shore where they're fishing. Peter's in the boat. He jumps out, swims to the shore, and there on the shore, Jesus reinstates Peter by saying, do you love me? Three times, do you love me? Do you love me? On each occasion, Peter says something like, yes. And then Jesus says, then feed my sheep. And Jesus reinstates him. This is the healing work of Jesus. This is what he does. He heals our relationship with the Lord. Which brings me to the fourth word. Jesus as Savior means that he's our victor. He holds victory. He's our Savior. He rescues us. He he delivers us. He's, He's our Savior he, he's our, our victor. He, he heals our relationship with the Lord. Two more truths that we learn from this story. These ones I'll go a little bit quicker with. But the angel goes on and says, The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born. And this critical word comes next. Today. A Savior has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, many people would have been anticipating a Messiah. Part of the great news was this, is that that Messiah is here today. And friends, I want to tell you, joy is possible today, and here's why. Because our Savior is here. He's here. This is why we call Jesus Emmanuel. God is with us. He is here. Now, you can know this Jesus now, and you can experience his joy today. Praise God. Does anybody know the joy of the Lord? Praise God. I love the next part. The angel tells them where this, this Jesus is going to be, and, and the shepherds kind of look at each other and say, well, let's go check it out. So they walk, and they, they find Jesus, and, and there they are, right in the presence of, of Jesus, the king. They find him in the manger. And, and the last truth about joy that I want to share with you this morning is this, is that joy is experienced in his presence. You want to know where joy is found? It's found in the presence of the king. It's found in the presence of of Jesus Christ. We can go after many brands of joy, many different things, but where you're going to find everlasting joy, where you're going to find the real thing, is in the presence of the Lord. Friends, this Christmas season, I want to encourage you to meet with Jesus. I want to encourage you to spend time with your Savior. I want to encourage you to get to know Him greater. I want to encourage you to get into the Word, allow Him to reveal Himself to you, allow Him to impart His joy in your life, no matter the season, no matter the circumstance. He is Emmanuel. God is with us. Let's pause and pray. Lord, I I recognize that this season for many, it's hard to live joy-filled lives. That might be because of loss. It might be because of family situations. Maybe there's financial stress, making this season a difficult one. Lord, I I pray that you might come suddenly, even now. Even now as I'm praying, Lord, would you come by your spirit? Would you encounter us that we might experience great joy? That our eyes might be lifted above our fears. That we might be able to receive this message this great news. But I pray that if, if we're placing our hope on the possibility of joy in, in, in some other wonderful or great thing, it might be disguising itself as great or wonderful, but I, I pray that we might turn to the source of real joy, that we might turn to you, Jesus. 
that we might remain in you and we might discover great joy. And uh, Lord, I think if I were to add a seventh truth from this story, it's this. Joy is shareable. I love the fact that the shepherds, after they are in the presence of Jesus, they go and they, they can't help it. They tell everybody. Their joy was overflowing. I pray, Lord, that we would have that kind of joy. That we'd experience your presence in such a way that we'd be overcome and that we would overflow with great joy. That we wouldn't be able to help but tell, tell people of this great news that a Savior has been born a deliverer, a healer, the one who has victory. So, Lord, um, as we come before you now and as we give to you, as we worship you through our giving, Lord, we do it out of a joyful heart because we just, we love you. We thank you for all things. And we want to say back to you this morning that you are our source of joy. We're wholeheartedly committed to you. I pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.